by the way, before I move into the message this morning, there's something that uh, I, I want to tell you. Tomorrow is a very special day to me personally. Seven years ago tomorrow, a little later in the day than this, I stood on this platform with the beautiful lady that's right over here on the front row. And she signed away the rest of her life to be my wife. And I am so grateful for that. I love you, Grace. And it's an honor to be your husband. This has been a, a very interesting week for me. Uh, last Sunday, by the time we left the church building, I was at a point of a voice that could just whisper. Uh, I had totally lost my voice. And I was scheduled to fly out at 7 o'clock Monday morning. I don't know why they do flights at 7 a.m. And then they want you at the airport two hours before that. That's just nuts to uh, have to be there before God even gets up in the morning. And uh, <coughs> so I knew I needed to, to go to Los Angeles. I felt it was very important. But I also knew that uh, I was not feeling well. And so I decided on Sunday evening to go to ReadyMed because I, especially with the current health scare that's going around the world, I didn't want to be getting on a plane whispering and all the people around me panicking that I'm boarding and uh, the, the, it was almost this isn't humorous but it was because when I went to ready med the nurse asked me if I had been uh, anywhere overseas recently and I started to say nowhere but China but I just <laughs> I thought that's that's not even funny so and I, I see you all are as sick as I am because you laughed but uh, anyway it turns out that I, I don't have flu, I don't have strep throat, it's just some allergy things that I've fought through the years and uh, so there's really not anything seriously wrong. But I, I got on the plane on Monday and headed to LA and uh, there was a big part of me that didn't want to go and yet there was a part of me that really wanted to be there. Uh, the meetings that I went to are a part of Foursquare Missions, Foursquare that we're a part of as a church, their uh, missions department has now a, a part of the strategy in sending new missionaries to go out into assignments for missions around the world is that they require them to go through training, which I think is very important. And one aspect of that training is they teach them how to find partners to partner with them financially in their ministry. And while they're in the process of raising their support before they go to be a missionary, then they also find pastors around the country to serve as a coach to that missionary who encourages them and who walks with them and basically holds them accountable that they're really following through on making the contacts to develop the partners that will, that will be with them and help to finance the ministry God's called them to. And I have done this before. As a matter of fact, that's how we connected with Saul Manuel Abal was uh, actually seven years ago, just a little over seven years ago, I did the same thing in a meeting that they were a part of as missionaries. And so this week was again a time where they'd asked me, would I come and do it again? And after two or three times, I'd said no. I had prayed about it and really felt like I was supposed to do it. And, and by the way, somewhere down the road, you'll be meeting him. <clears throat> but I connected and will be working with a missionary who actually is already deployed, is already serving as a missionary in Colombia in South America. Uh, his name is Aaron Hunter, and he's from, I believe, Tacoma, Washington, Washington State. Uh, he's married, and I think they have five kids, the youngest of which is five weeks old, and live in Colombia, and he travels all over South America and Central America 
training and developing youth leaders, a dynamic, uh, dynamic young man, probably, I would guess, Aaron's in his early 30s, African-American, uh, just a very charismatic personality. And uh, his wife is actually uh, Honduran. He, he went, when he came out of Bible college, he went to Honduras and went as a missionary, and his assignment was to be youth pastor in a church in Honduras that runs 30,000 in their church. That was his first assignment. And one Sunday, he was in church, and the pastor called him and said, Aaron, I want you to come to the platform. And there was a young woman who was a part of the church that, that is from Honduras, and he said, Francis, I want you to come to the platform. And he looked at him, and he said, the two of you need to talk. They're now married. So uh, interesting, interesting life. But I'm going to have the privilege of working with him because as his ministry is expanding, he's going to need to be able to raise more funds to do the expanded part of the ministry God's giving him. So he and I will be uh, Skyping on a regular basis and then working. And I've already talked to him about somewhere I want him to come to Fort Wayne and meet all of you. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll have his wife and all the kids come and uh, they can stay with Ray and Tanya, and Tanya at their house. And uh, so uh, anyway, we'll just see what God has in the days ahead. But it was just a, a great week. And, and this particular time, the meetings that we had were all held at uh, the area where Angelus Temple is. Angelus Temple is in Echo Park in Los Angeles and was the church that the founder of Foursquare, Amy Semple McPherson, started back in the 1920s. Uh, Sister Amy was in her early 30s when she came to Los Angeles, a divorced single mom with a powerful call of God on her life, and began holding meetings that turned into Angelus Temple. And in a very short time, by 1923, they had built the building that still holds services every week that would seat 5,000 people, and they were filling it three times on Sunday and throughout the week, every day, 5,000 people. So important was what was happening there that the city trolley system would actually have to run extra cars on Sunday so that people could get to the church because that's how high demand it was for people to come to be a part of Angelus Temple. So it was interesting to be in this uh, building that has so much history. It's where Life Pacific College was founded. And uh, Fred Thompson, how many of you have ever had a Thompson Chain Reference Bible? The guy who put that together actually used to be uh, one of the lead teachers in the early days of that Bible college. Smith Wigglesworth used to fill the pulpit regularly for Sister Amy when she was out of town. So much of the heritage of who we are as a church and of the movement of Pentecostal charismatic work in America and the world goes back, and, and then the Azusa Street Revival just happened a short distance from where Angelus Temple is. And one of the days I actually had a chance during our lunch break and, and was a little late back to the afternoon session to go right next door on the same complex is the house that Sister Amy lived in for 14 years during the time that she was pastoring the church. Originally built it to be the school, but by the time it was built, it wasn't big enough for the school, so they built the building next door, and she converted it into her house. And it was so interesting going through the house. There was a dear little lady that uh, probably is in her late 70s that, that did the tour through the house that has spent her whole life there and just so immersed in all of this. It was just very interesting. I didn't know this. Uh, Marilyn Monroe's grandmother went to Angelus Temple. Marilyn Monroe was dedicated as a baby in Angelus Temple. Just a number of people, Anthony Quinn, the actor, said we would have starved to death if it hadn't been for the feeding programs that Sister Amy did in the 1930s. 
Just a powerful, powerful ministry God raised up in her. And I thought about this week what we're a part of. What I was a part of with, with missions and, and ministry that's going around the world. And all of it came because a single divorced mom in her early 30s refused to let anything stop her. And this was in the 1920s. Women didn't have exactly the same rights they do today. And she built this powerful, powerful church. And I believe the reason she did that is because at some level she understood what we've been talking about these last few weeks. About how do you possess the inheritance that God has given you. She had come to know the Lord as a, as a teenage girl. Ended up marrying the evangelist that had led her to the Lord. They went as missionaries to Hong Kong. And while they're there, he gets sick and died. And now she comes back home with a little baby. On the ship back from Hong Kong, you know what Sister Amy did? Secluded herself in a room and didn't talk to anybody the whole trip. No, that's not true. She ran Sunday school on the boat every, every day on the way back home. Everywhere she went, she took the gospel. No matter what she did, she was consumed with what she knew God had put in her and became such a powerful voice that changed the world in such a powerful way. And, and if there's a tragedy with Sister Amy, it's the fact that she died so young. She was 53 when she died. And uh, I think one of the things that's important for us to remember People do powerful things for God, and yet we, we still live in a world that's a sinful world, and we have an enemy who's out to destroy us. And that's why it's so important that we know the Word of God and know how to stand. And yet, at the age of 53, Amy ended up passing away. And if you look on the surface, it would seem like the world was robbed way too soon. And I believe it was. And yet, here's the amazing thing. A hundred years later, roughly, today, out of a single mom in Los Angeles, Angeles Temple is still alive and well. The building that was the college is still functioning just like it did in the 1920s. That's where we met every day. And now there is a Spanish-speaking Bible Institute in that building because Life Pacific College has moved to another location. And there is still services happening every weekend at Angelus Temple. And there's a large Hispanic congregation, and it's connected with the Dream Center just a few blocks away. And so powerful ministry is still happening where she started the original church. But in addition to that, today there will be people meeting in about 90,000 places around the world in a church that is considered Foursquare. We're one of those. And there are 8.8 .8 million people and we're in 146 nations. All because God redeemed the years that were lost because Amy went home at age 53, but God wasn't finished with the work she had started. He raised up her son, he raised up others, and now he's raised up a whole group of people around the world who are living out what it is to possess your inheritance. And today as we wind this series up, I want to talk to you about <coughs> possessing your time. How do we make the most of the time God has entrusted to us? You know, we started out this year talking about the best is yet to come. And I hope you don't think that that is just a catchphrase we came up with because it isn't. I think it's a powerful truth that's a prophetic word for us of what God 
wants to do in and through us as a church. But I think the real question that comes down to us individually is how are we going to live and do we live the fully abundant life God called us to and do we really live that best that God has for us? Are we living the full potential of the inheritance? And it's by taking possession of the things that the thief has come to destroy. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have abundantly. And so <clears throat> over these weeks, we've talked about some of those ways that the enemy wants to rob us and the ways that we have to go past and take the inheritance we've been given. The first of those is our identity in Christ. We need to recognize our identity is in who he is. And we talked at great length about that a few weeks ago. We talked about God's word and the importance of it, about what our own words are and how we talk and what we say, our soul, our mind, our will, emotion. And then we talked a couple of weeks ago about our marriage and last week about our call and our position. All of those are things that we look at that we must possess that the enemy wants to rob from us. And yet today, I want us to look at this one more area that ties into all those. And that is how do we possess our inheritance and have our time fulfill everything that God has given to us so that we literally do learn how to possess our time. That's interesting. If you lose money, it can be restored. If you have property that gets lost, that can be restored. Relationships can be restored. But you can't bring yesterday back. It's gone. Time flies, and no matter what happens, we can't get them back. But God promised us is the impossible because he says, I will restore time. There's a great book in the Old Testament, the book of Joel. That book was written during a time when Judah had gone far away from what God intended for them to be. And the land had become desolate. They had had a plague of, of locusts. How many of you have ever had locusts around? When I was a kid, we used to have locusts. And I can remember that we would catch them. And we would uh, take string and wrap around their body and tie it. And then a little bit of a, a couple of feet for them. And then you'd turn them loose and let them fly. And they'd still fly for a little while. It eventually, it kind of ended their lives a little sooner than originally would have happened without that. But, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of things when I was a child I had to repent of. But probably worse than that is I baptized my kittens one time. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> but locusts can be devastating to crops. And that's what had happened with Judah. Their land had, had totally been devastated by the locusts. And now this was a place of desolation and destruction and people and animals were dying. And it really was the judgment of God on Judah's sins. And Moses had warned them hundreds of years before that this would happen to them if they didn't faithfully serve God. But God is always a God of mercy. It's a wonderful thing about who God is. And so basically, he calls them to repentance that if they will repent, he will destroy. Now, while this was written to Judah hundreds of years ago, the truth of it is still for us today because we live in a different time. We live in the time where Jesus has come and brought redemption. So if anything, we're in a time where it actually flows easier for us to have the fullness of what Joel talks about. But there is a promise in Joel 2, 25, where God promises that he will restore lost time. Verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, 
the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And that's a promise for you and I today. Whatever is happening in our world, whatever is going on that is discouraging, whatever you wish you could take back that has happened in the past, I am here to tell you today, God wants to restore the lost years of your life. I don't think there's anybody here, anybody joining us online today that hasn't had things in life that have been devastating. All of us experience pain because we live in a sinful world. We, we lose loved ones. We have times where we have death that hits us so hard. And, and now the plans that we had made with those people or that person in our life are, are forever changed because they're gone. Sickness can affect us. I, I, I was so shocked a couple of weeks ago when we got the call that our granddaughter Bella had had a stroke, 10 years old. By the way, they went on Monday to therapy for an evaluation and the physical therapist told them that they need to do absolutely no therapy. <laughs> and I actually didn't charge them anything for the appointment. And God could. But we get hit with things. I, I think we live in a world where there's been so many people who have been victimized by abuse. So many relationships where abusive things scar lives, rob childhoods, so that children get exposed at way too early an age to things they shouldn't be exposed to that then they carry the scars of that the rest of their lives. We live in a world in, in which we have so many people who have careers they think are going great, and all of a sudden you get that notice you've lost your job. Your economic security just went out the window. There, there's so many ways that the locusts rob from our lives. Sometimes it's our own selfishness, the things that we pursue ourselves that, that aren't the best thing for us. And the things we get caught up into, lifestyles, years without love, years of rebellion. The time that we've lived without letting Christ be the center of our life. All of those become years that as you look back at them can seem to be wasted years. And, and we wish, could I get a do-over? I, I, I get amazed when I realize how fast time passes. And I look around and I see people that are my age, and they're old people. I don't know what happened to them. You know, it's just amazing when you look at how life is like a vapor, the Word of God says. And when we look, how do we make the most of the time? How do we have time restored that has been lost? Because in the natural, there's no way to do that. But I'm here to tell you today, we have a supernatural God. And part of his inheritance is he restores what the locust has stolen. So where does that start with us? It's the understanding that he restores our past. Whatever has been painful for you in the past, whatever has been wasted, whatever has been lost, this morning... I want you to determine that you are not going to be held back by that ever again. Amen. This is going to be a day where God sets you free. Isaiah 43, verse 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Say with me, 
new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. What is it from the past that holds you? People who've hurt you, who've offended you. I think this is so huge. Because there isn't a person that's hearing this today that hasn't had someone hurt you. And for some of you this week, people have hurt you. There's a void that's left by the pain of what's done. And we need to have restored everything the enemy has robbed with that. And the beginning of that comes through embracing forgiveness. The beginning of forgiveness is us letting Jesus come into our heart. Because when we receive his forgiveness in our life, it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But there's a catch that is often hard for us at the end of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus says, as you forgive others. That's where it gets hard, isn't it? Because the problem is that people have done things to me that they did. They were wrong. They shouldn't have done it. I have a right to be upset if I'm looking at it from a natural perspective. But the key is if we hold unforgiveness, you know what we're actually doing? We're holding on to that person. Have you ever have, have you ever had fruit in the refrigerator? I, I love those little uh, mandarin oranges, the little cuties they call them. Have you ever reached into the bag? Not looking. I keep them in the refrigerator so they're nice and cold. Have you ever just reached in and not looked and you pick one out and all of a sudden you don't even need to look at it? You know that it's gone bad. And then when you look at it, it's no longer this beautiful little orange fruit. It's got this yucky, moldy look. And you're going, yeah. What do you do with it? You get rid of that sucker. You don't look at it and say, I was going to eat you and you have disappointed me and I, I am so upset with you. I just, I, I've got to hold, I'm just going to squeeze you even tighter because you kept me from having the wonderful snack that I was going to have because you went rotten on me. We'd worry about you if you did that. <laughs> what do you do? You throw it away, you wash your hands off and you go and you find another one. That won't disappoint you. So why is it that when we've been hurt, we hold on and not let go of where we've been hurt? And you know what the truth is? As long as you hold on to it, that stench stays attached to you. Have you ever noticed this? That frequently the people that have hurt you you look at and they seem to be just going on and everything is just working very well for them. Have you ever had somebody cheat you out of money and you've been hurt financially and you're watching them drive down the street in a new car and you're still driving that old beater? Makes you just want to go slash their tires, doesn't it? <laughs> but the truth is, you hold on to that and what happens? It doesn't destroy them. It destroys you. And so not only do you lose what was robbed then, but it continues to rob you. And that's why God wants us to be forgiven. 
And that's why our soul is where we encounter God. Our, our emotions were made to experience the fullness of what our spirit has been reborn to enjoy. But when our soul is damaged with the hurt and pain of what sin has done to us, it keeps our emotions from having the freedom to worship in the way that God wants us to worship him. And so we hold on to that stuff within our lives. And then what happens? We reach a point where we can forgive and we let go. And I'm doing great. And two weeks later, here comes that turkey around in that new car again. And what happens to me is all of it just floods right back over my soul. And that's why Jesus said to the disciples, you need to keep forgiving 70 times 7. So that you keep letting it go. You keep throwing that bad Mandarin away. You keep taking away the mold out of your lives. But it's also important to understand this. The blood of Jesus covers our sins. And when I ask forgiveness, I'm forgiven. And I can then give that forgiveness to others. But when we have been damaged, how many of you know that if you, if, if you bump your leg on something real hard? Have you ever done this? And then you walk away and say, well, that's going to leave a bruise. You don't even have to look at it because you know later when you look at it. And, and you can be going about the rest of your day and all of a sudden you bump up against something in that same spot and what happens? It hurts because you, you realize that you bruised it. And so it's still there in that it's left an impression that wounded your flesh. Do you understand that's the same thing that happens to us with the issues that cause unforgiveness? But I'm here to tell you that Jesus didn't just come and put sin under his blood, but he arose triumphant over sin, death, hell, and the grave, and he heals the bruises of Satan with his resurrection power. You and I need to declare the resurrection power because it is that power that reinvigorates, restores lives, and brings back the years that the canker worm has destroyed. And so when we do that, it's amazing what God restores. The other thing God does is give us testimony. He gives us the ability. And in our testimony, there's healing every time we share that, every time we bring it back to life. And, and then God also is able to take control of our memory so that our memories of failure, shame, condemnation, where the word of God is twisted, begins to be replaced with the memories of God's faithfulness, of God's answered prayers, of the promises of God with Scripture that we can bring back to the beautiful times we share as a part of the family of God so that now our memories are restored so that it's not about the pain of the past, it's about the goodness of what God has. I, I, I remember a few years ago when I was going through some old stuff and I had a file where I had stuff that I had documented where I had been hurt in a situation. And I remember I looked at that and I thought, why am I holding on to this file? I threw it away. Because you see, I'm not controlled by the things that have happened that have been disappointed. And for every person who's ever hurt me in the body of Christ, I have at least 10 people for everyone that's hurt me who have been incredible love and support to me. And I have a wonderful church family at LifeBridge Church that accepts me for just who I am. And so I have wonderful memories of what God has done here, what God is doing here. I have wonderful memories of what God has done in my life. I just told you, seven years ago tomorrow, I can close my eyes right now. I can still see that beautiful woman walking down this aisle thinking, oh, God, don't let her figure out what she's getting into. <laughs> it's a precious memory. It makes me just want to go home and leave everybody else here. I'm going to take her with me. <laughs> but you see, God wants to redeem our memories. He wants to restore them. He wants them to be brought back so that we don't 
forget the things that have been done, but we remember them without the pain anymore. We remember them with the promises of God that have been fulfilled that's brought us through. And so you and I need to let God restore our past. That literally he brings us into a newness that today is the day that the Lord has made. I can rejoice and be glad in it. And all of the past that has been painful, that has not been what it could be, is washed under the blood of Jesus. And I am set free to live in the fullness of everything God has. Not only does he restore the past but he also restores our present. We live in a crazy world. It's a busy world. And and we get in quandrums of what do we do? I remember Monday morning, I'm standing in the airport in Chicago to change planes. And I get the word that our dear Doris Romy has just gone home to be with the Lord. And I remember thinking, what do I do? Do I, do I come back home to Fort Wayne? Because I knew there would be a funeral that would be coming up. Or do I go on to California and then let that be worked out later in the week? And I made the choice to go to California. And guess what? It was all taken care of anyway. The funeral wasn't until yesterday. I was able to fulfill what I needed to do this week and still be present to be a part of honoring the dear life of our dear Doris Roma yesterday. It's amazing how God has our stuff worked out if we can just relax and let go. You know what, if I needed to come back home, God would have worked it out. God would have made a way. Our problem is that we're too busy worrying with the stuff we're too caught up with how's it going to all work out. And, and many times the things that we are so worried about never materialize anyway. H- have you ever noticed that? That the things that you get all out of shape over are things that down the road you look back and say, well, that wasn't what I thought it was going to be anyway. And the things that do happen, it's amazing how you look back and you realize God always makes a way. And so you and I need to live in a world that we don't let the busyness rob us of the preciousness of this moment. That we learn how to live the fullest of what God has given us. One of the days when I was in Texas, the kids were at school, Aaron and Cecily were at work, and it was just me. And you know what I did? I went to Whataburger. (laughs) Just me. And I just sat there I relished every bite. Every bit of the onion on it, I didn't care because it was just me. I was living in that Whataburger moment. Why don't we live more like that to the fullest of what God has given us? Enjoy. It is going to be 50 degrees today. If we lived in Florida, this would be a cold day. In Indiana, many of you will be out in your short sleeves this afternoon. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let him redeem the present. Let the busyness. The meetings I was in this week, one of the things they asked us to do was turn our phones off. And I don't know about you, but, but I think about how in the last 20 years, our world has changed. 20 years ago, most of us, if you had one of these, it was sure not this sophisticated. I still remember my first flip phone. And I thought I was tall stuff. Then uh, I remember whatever the one that came out before iPhones, that if you're a business person, you had to have. I can't remember what it was called now. Blackberry, yeah, everybody had to have a Blackberry. Now, I don't even know, do they even exist? I don't think so. Only thing we have left is Blackberry Cobbler, and they're a lot better. (laughs) But the truth is, this has become a robber of time. A convenience, and yet how the enemy twists us up with it. And there's a button on your phone 
that I would encourage you to occasionally just shut her down and just live in the present. God wants to redeem our time. God wants us to be able to live a balanced life. And the way we do that is very simple. In looking back here at our, our logo, we look up. The very first thing we do is get connected in that vertical relationship with God. And out of that relationship, then we can engage. The vertical then brings us into the horizontal of how we are able to live with each other. And out of that relationship with God, then we can come down and also live with how we reach into the world. And that's what God's called us to do. It begins in the relationship with him. Do you every day take time to just be alone with God? Do you take time for his presence? How do we let ourselves not get caught? We, we rob our present between two thieves yesterday and tomorrow. We're either worried about what happened or we're worried about what's going to happen. And the truth of the matter is God wants to restore us. And he restores and refreshes us and refreshes our time if we allow him to do that in the present. And it all comes about by living in an awareness of his presence. God's here. I want you to think about that for just a minute. His presence is everywhere. And his presence is in every one of us as believers. When you came in today, you brought God with you. The way some of us live, he may have come in kicking and screaming, but he's with you if you're his. Jesus lives inside of you. We have to do that. We have to stop and think. You get caught up in what you're dealing with. And in the process of being caught up with that, we lose sight of the fact that we have the creator of the universe available to help us. Are you trying to figure out what you're going to do about something today? What if you just determined that you're not going to do anything until you've spent a little bit of time in his presence? And that in his presence, you begin to have clarity. You just sing that old song in his presence, fullness of joy. Remember that song? So many things that give us everything we need when we begin to be aware and operate in a constant awareness of his presence. And if you have to, stop everything and renew his presence in you. And then he restores the future. Because you see, as you redeem your past and your present, you are redeeming your future. <laughs> because we get so caught up with planning for tomorrow. I, I, when I was in Fort Myers and was the administrator of the church there, I had a saying that I used to say to the staff all the time, if we can just get through these next two weeks... And guess what would happen? We'd get through those two weeks, and I'd say, if we can just get through these next two weeks, to the point that when I left there, they gave me a little plaque that said, if we can just get through these next two weeks. Because we live our lives like that, and we rob the future because we're not living to the fullness of letting God heal the past and to take our present. Because the other thing that you begin to find out is God has miraculous things he does with the things he's taught you from what you've gone through in the past. When you begin to allow that to happen, it's amazing how even the things that seem futile in the past aren't because they're learning grounds that God now can use for what he's wanting to to do in us and when we begin to live now then we're not having to fret about how are we going to be set for tomorrow because as we live to the fullness today we're going to be ready for what tomorrow is so that we can live completely in what God has and then the other thing that I would challenge you to do is reclaim your imagination when you were a kid did you ever just go lay down on the ground and look up at the clouds? 
And did you see things in the clouds? The shapes of the clouds, you know, you could see people's faces. You could see animals. Depends on what your imagination was, what all you could see in those clouds. And the problem we have is we live in a world that the enemy wants to rob us of imagination. Because you see, can you imagine when God decided to do creation? God has to have an amazing imagination. You know, think about this. Think what God must have been thinking when he created hippopotamus. And then he turned around and he created a beautiful horse. How did this same God create those two things? Just an amazing imagination. Remember the old fireside cartoon where God's taking and rolling like this and he says, these snakes are easy to make. It's amazing the creative power of God that's vested inside of you. What do you imagine? When I look out our back door, you know what I see? I don't see our backyard like it is. How many of you have ever been into the lobby at Parkview Hospital? Have you ever seen that waterfall that's in the lobby? I'm going to tell you, I see that in my backyard. I haven't gotten Grace there yet, but I'm working on her. Is it going to happen? Well, I think so. But there's imaginations that are far more important than that that are very much alive in me. Things of what God wants to do. I've already started thinking about Aaron, the missionary I'm going to be working with. What could happen if I could help him be inspired to reach hundreds of thousands of kids and leaders of kids in South and Central America. What an accident that God took me there. What an accident that we were at the place that Amy Semple used to live and where the church is because there was a woman of imagination. God raised up Christians and believers who will dare to imagine that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think or imagine because our tomorrows will go far beyond what we could think. You know, this week, in case you couldn't tell, this week had a lot of impact on me. I'm still sorting it all out. But the gentleman who asked me to come be a part of that has become a friend to me through the last several years. It's a man by the name of George Klein. George has been a four-square pastor since Moses. I'll, I don't know exactly, but I think George is either 77 or 78. And it's interesting, he was sharing this week that for 30 years he was a pastor of a four-square church and he never, ever invited missionaries to come to his church. He said, I didn't like missionaries. Because they always brought these slides about stuff that I didn't care about. And they were usually boring speakers. And I just really didn't want to have missionaries. So for 30 years, he never had a missionary come in his church. And then one day, God got a hold of George. And literally, he said he ended up falling out under the power of the Holy Spirit. And he started to get up. And he felt a thumb on his forehead. And it was the thumb of God. <laughs> and he said, literally, he wouldn't let me up until I had surrendered. And when George got up, he had a heart for missions. And very short time after, this man who for 30 years didn't want to have anything to do with missions actually went to work for Four Square Missions about the time that most people retire and has traveled all over the world, has led many pastors on missions trips for their first time because he, he has a passion for pastors to have a heart for missions. He, George has had diabetes for years. He had... Uh, heart attack and bypass surgery three years ago. He has hearing devices that he controls with his phone uh, to hear with. So George has challenges. 
but you'd never know it. He's the most gracious man I think I've ever met. And he's vibrant. He's full of life. I looked up there. I was in the back when we were doing Zumba, kind of observing more than Zumbaing. And uh, there was George on the front row. He was, he was into it. But here's the thing. What God has done in him is an amazing thing. And Foursquare has done a lot of rearranging in how they do things. And they really try to streamline every way possible. And they came to him a few months ago, now in his late 70s, and they said, George, we still need you to do what you do. But we really are not in a position to keep paying you what you're doing. Would you begin to raise your support? Which is kind of an irony because he's the one who heads up this training for missionaries to raise their support. And so here at 77 years old, George said yes to being a missionary. He'll be spending part of the time in Europe because he has a passion for Europe, part of the time in the Caribbean, and then part of the time doing what we did last week and encouraging and raising up pastors to have a heart for missions. And George said the other night at dinner, he says, here's the deal. He says, I used to ask God to let me live till I was 90 and be passionately working till I'm 90. And then he said, I decided to stretch it to 95. And then I thought, why not go for 100? I said, then I was talking to somebody and they said, well, you know, in the Bible, the common age for people to live to is 120. So George looked at us the other night and he says, I'm planning to live till I'm 120 and do what I'm doing. I don't plan to quit. He literally had not been home in over 30 days because he had been on the mission field before he came to California. I believe God has restored the years that the canker worm destroyed for 30 years in George Klein. So I guess I'm saying to us today, no excuses. If George can do that, I told him the other day, because he's either 77 or 78, I said, you know, George, you're actually just at the right age to run for president of the United States. (laughs) But the truth is that we look and make excuses for why we can't live into the fullness of what God has given us. And today, as we end this series on possessing your inheritance, I challenge you to let God restore every year that the canker worm has destroyed in your life. Father, help us to hear you today. Help us to determine that we're going to be the people you've called us to be. And that we're going to be used in a powerful way. God, we may not be Sister Amy. We may not be George. But you have just as unique a call in our lives as you have in theirs. Help us to live to the full potential of who you've called us to be. And I thank you in advance for the kingdom work you're going to accomplish through us. As we say yes to you. As we obey your voice. Maybe you've walked in today. Maybe you're joining us online. You don't know Jesus. Just a moment, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. You can pray with me. You can ask Jesus to come into your heart. Those of you in the room with me, pray this prayer with me as an affirmation for those praying it for the first time. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. I receive you now. Thank you for being my Savior. Amen.